very excited again to introduce the, uh, the third keynote of the conference. Um, as, I, as I've been mentioning about the keynotes, we're trying to broaden our view, broaden our perspective a little bit. So we heard about, we heard about OER and copyright issues first, then yesterday about open access to research, and today about, we're going to hear about open science from John. Um, John's bio, as you can imagine, is very long. Uh, but he currently works at Sage Bio Networks, where they build tools and policies to help <coughs> help networks of people who uh, have their own health data share it, and networks of people who like to analyze health data engage in that activity as well. Uh, before coming to Sage, he was at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, uh, at the World Wide Web Consortium, that would be fun to hear about, at the U.S. House of Representatives. He was with Science Commons, and has done all kinds of interesting things on the advocacy side and, and on many fronts. But it will be, we're just, you're in for a real treat. I assume that many of you don't know much, if anything at all, about open science because it's, again, it's not something that we talk about. And uh, it's just going to be great to listen to, to what he has to say and think about how to connect it into our work and, and broaden our minds or maybe we could say open our minds a little bit further to other open work that's going on in the field. So please help me welcome John to the stage. John. So here's the 30 seconds of awkward time filling while I plug in. Um, and so I like to fill, to fill that by saying, would the organizers of the conference please stand up? Besides David, who else is organizer? Can we give them a hand, please? OK, so if this works well, I'll be talking in a second. Let's see. I don't have my login screen. There we go. There's nothing like the first talk on a Friday morning at the end of a long conference. So I hope that I am interesting and engaging enough to get you awake. Um, and I didn't really know what to talk about because I haven't worked in sort of OER uh, ever. I've worked near OER when I was at Creative Commons. Uh, but most of what I do, as David alluded, is, is science-based. But I wanted to try to connect the science to the education because I feel like we often are creating open silos, whether we realize it or not. And so the OER group doesn't talk to the open science group, doesn't talk to the open access group, except inside the advocacy organizations um, or the tools organizations that connect them. And that's a shame, because what's happening to us in science affects education. And what's happening in education affects us in science, because you don't become a scientist without going through an educational process. And both of these are affected by the broader culture. And so um, I wanted to start by talking about the impact of prediction culture uh, on science and how I think that's going to affect education. So the classic quote here is attributed to Yogi Berra, right? But when you dig into it, it's actually really interesting. This goes back a couple hundred years to Denmark. Right? This is an old Danish phrase. Uh, and it's been attributed to Yogi Berra, who did say it. It's been attributed to an economist who did say it. And the amazing thing about it is how quickly you can find the origin of a phrase like this using the internet, right? using Google. Uh, and in many ways, that's possible because all of the old books that are available that contain this phrase are in the public domain. So they have been scanned, and I can rapidly analyze them. Nothing, of course, from... Uh, the, the, the last 20 or five or so years is available in that context. So I can only track it to the late 1960s from an etymology perspective. But it's a great comment. And this was really true. Right? It was really hard to make predictions about the future. But it's increasingly the case. Did we lose anything here? I'm plugged in. I swear I have slides. Do we have any ideas? Do you want to just unplug and plug back in? Let's see. Check the input terminal. That might not be connected. 
I was just getting warmed up. There you go. Here we go. All right. Yep. There you go. Just fired up. Okay. There we go. All right. So, all right. Thank you, David. I was just getting warmed up. So the, the thing about predictions, right, is that, that predictions are increasingly accurate. And so weather is the easiest example. But when you think about it, it's predictions about ourselves that are the most accurate things that we can make predictions about right now. And as an example, and I, didn't, I was sort of thinking about this yesterday when I was, was putting this together, uh, is that every single website I went to was trying to sell me Tylenol. I mean, literally, and not only that, Tylenol PM, too. And so I don't know, I mean, I've been traveling pretty much every day for the last two weeks. And so it's not like they know me. They literally know me because of the kinds of things I type into Google. And the ability to index my email in which I complain to Carolina about how bad my back hurts from all the flights I've been taking, or where I complain about how I'm having trouble sleeping, an email to my family because I'm jet lagged. Right? The ability to mine that allows them to make increasingly accurate predictions about what I'm going to do. And if you want to see a visualization of that, so this is the engram for the appearance in the, 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 of the, word, the phrase data mining in books over the last 100 or so years, 200 years. Right? It's not a phrase that ever existed, and it has literally exploded in books, in journals, and so forth. And that is why we can make increasingly accurate predictions about me or about you. It's because we have this aggregate of information about ourselves and we can use mathematical tools to mine it to make predictions. And in particular, what we're talking about is probability. Right? The kind of mining that we're doing is not sort of proof-based. It says, what's the probability that John needs Tylenol based on all the prior information we've got about John? And the tools for this are not related to advertising. They're basic mathematical tools. And they're available to anyone who's got enough data about a large enough group of individuals or a large enough subject matter to use them. And so you know, I work mainly in the life sciences. And it's an academic field that is increasingly data-driven and, and increasingly less narrative-driven. Because biology really was a story-based discipline despite all of the trappings. Uh, up until about 25 years ago or so. And the data is overcoming it, and it's rapidly turning into a prediction science or a probability-based science. And that comes from the cost of data as much as anything. And you know, we like to talk about sort of data liberation, data sharing. You know, if data is expensive, people don't like to share it. If data is cheap, it becomes increasingly smart to share. And so the cost of the data is an incredibly important factor. And you see the impact of this where you go from you know, sequencing right around the time that the cost of this started to be tracked is 2001. So that's when we announced the reference genome. That's where this graph begins. Uh, and somewhere around 2008, right, we crossed the line in Metcalfe's law where the cost of compatibly generating this stuff um, broke. And that's exactly the time in which you see a company like 23andMe come onto the scene and provide a consumer service for something that used to be the exclusive province of a credentialed, titled PhD scientist at a major research institution. Right? So suddenly, like I have the power to get something that was only the exclusive power of a scientist to give me in the past. And indeed, they wouldn't give it to me. And this is not just genomes. This is a startup company called Science Exchange. I have no stake in this company. Um, they were a company that said, you know, we could do an eBay style thing for all the overbuilt core facilities at American land grant research universities. So during the, the prior decade, during the real estate boom, there was a lot of easy money going around in the sciences. And a lot of people bought gigantic machines to do research. And now that the NIH budgets are flat or dropping, those machines aren't getting used. So they're starting to farm them out. And if you look at this, right, Microarray, right, I started a company based on microarrays about 15 years ago. It's insane that they're $100 per sample. Um, DNA sequencing, $2.50 per sample. So uh, I tested this. I said, well, what happens if I, wanted to, if I said I want to take 500 women and see if they have the BRCA1 and BRCA2 breast cancer genes? How much will it cost me? And I got it down to $200 per sample for that, including biobanking and shipping. And no one ever asked me for a credential except uh, whether or not my credit card had enough room on it. And I would call your attention in particular to the last one, which is bioinformatics. So bioinformatics is the analysis of this data. It was the hottest job discipline in biology in the last decade. $50 an hour. My plumber costs $100 an hour. 
And so I raise all of this because you know, when you can generate data this cheaply and the tools for analyzing it are being sort of democratized by the advertising culture, the cost of this just drops and drops and drops. And that's coming to basically every academic discipline that has any impact from data. And so I tried to think of a field that was as far away from biology as I could, so I chose archaeology. This is open context. It's run by the awesome Kansas in, in Berkeley, Eric. Kansas is, is a dear friend. Um, and so the big circles represent 150,000 records of archive data or archaeological data in an archive. And so it's obviously it's clustered around the Middle East and North Africa because that's the cradle of archaeology in many ways. Um, but you see it popping up elsewhere. So, uh, and even, even the field of etymology has been changed as we started out with this quote by the fact that I can basically apply large scale data analytics to finding the origin of a string of text. So it's easy to think, oh, that's biology. It's not coming to me. I think it is, right? Because everything is text, right? If you're going to be a deconstructionist. And if everything can be indexed by Google as text, then basically every field has got a data wave coming at it and we're going to have to deal with it. And uh, just to really freak you out, these are all the open source sensors you can buy for under $30. There's about 150 listed on this page. I could have chosen any number of vendors. Basically, anything that you want to measure is increasingly measurable. Anything you want to index is increasingly indexable. We can have a debate at another time about whether that's good or not. But that is what's happening. And so probability is going to be the coin of academic disciplines. The ability to take this data and do probabilistic analysis on it is already differentiating the top biology labs from the other biology labs. It is already differentiating the top text analyzers from the other text analyzers. And the tools that do this are increasingly free because it makes a ton of sense if you're Google or Amazon or whatever to make sure that you're farming, right? you're, you're growing as many people who can do analysis for you as possible. And so in the search to sell us sweaters and Tylenol, these tools are going to be made available to science, and they're going to be made available to archaeology, and they're going to be made available to teachers and students um, in a way that has never, ever existed. And that's weird. Right? It changes the way that we know what we know. Right? Because we used to think we knew something and it was stable for a while. Right? We would say, you know, the central dogma of molecular biology, right? the way that genes and proteins interact with each other, that's a stable fact. Right? If you think about Latour and his theory of the way that we know things, what you wanted was something that was so well known that people associated it with you automatically, like Watson and Crick and DNA. But the stability of what you know changes in a probability culture because the probability literally changes every time you give it new information. So the stability of what we know in all of these data-driven sciences is dropping. And this is just a graph of, of a derivative or rate of change. The rate of change is increasing. Right? The rate of change at which what we know as a net increases as we add data to it, because literally every day what we think we know is changing as we feed more data to the model. And this is a way of life in technology. It's increasingly a way of life in biology. Right? And it's changing the educational cultures of those fields in a way that I think is interesting. Right, it changes the way that groups come together and start to know things. And that's going to really change the way that we need to train those people and communicate what we know to those people. And, and what we're learning in biology is that the pedagogy for biology is completely failing. It's completely failing to teach people how to live in this kind of world. Um, the average scientist who's getting her first NIH grant is getting her grant at 39 to 42 years old. That's for the first R01. That means that she's at least 10 years out of graduate school, which means she exited graduate school before Facebook and before iPhones. And the concept of the pedagogy in biology is that you're done, right? You got your PhD. There's no continuing education in biology. Your PhD means you're credentialed. You get measured on a couple of publications over a multi-year period. You don't have to learn anything more. We gave you a PhD. And it's creating a total failure in the ability of the people who have been trained in biology to deal with the reality of the data flood that's coming to biology. So when we talk about platforms or plat the platform of the future for the life sciences or for education in general, you know, I, I, a lot of times we'll talk about a journal publishing platform or a textbook publishing platform. You know, when, we, when we look at tech, which again, I mean, it's not the perfect metaphor. There's a lot of jerks in tech. Uh, 
but when we talk about this, we talk about multi-sided platforms where the network effects make it better both for the, the buyer and for the seller. So eBay is a great example of this, right? Uber, Airbnb, all these things get better for each side as it gets larger. Right? And I, you know, I've deleted Uber for a variety of reasons this week, but it's a good example that the more drivers there are, the better it is as a rider. And the more riders, the better it is as a driver. And the thing about all of these markets is they're rental economies. They're not sharing economies. Right? They don't do any political empowerment. They're terrible from a labor perspective. They're sort of contractor and renter economies. And what's funny is that they're all created in a way that for, the most of, for most of them tries to segregate the buyers and the sellers. Like Uber doesn't want you to be both a driver and a rider. It's really important to Uber that the drivers aren't the riders. And this is totally different than the way that we first say text, and that we're both receiving and sending text messages, right? We are both sides of the market in something like a text platform. And my fear is that education, pedagogy around the sciences are moving towards this model, right, where you're either a buyer or a seller of information, but almost never both as opposed to something more like a texting model where you do both, right? You change on a, on a daily basis depending on where you are and what you do. And that's a bummer, right? Because these are markets that are, they are better than the status quo because the status quo is terrible, right? In textbooks, the status quo is to print it. And that's terrible. And so a, a buyer-seller two-sided market in textbooks is better than the status quo, right? But it would be a real shame if our goal was to be better than terrible. Right? That doesn't strike me as a high enough aim. And so when you look at something like you know, connections as a multi-open-sided platform, right, or OER generally as an open multi-sided platform, right, I know that connections has become OpenStax and CNX, right, and I'm using it just as an example here. Um, these are examples of open multi-sided platforms where you're both a contributor and a consumer, right, where you're allowed to flexibly shift based on whether you're an educator or a learner on any given day, right? Wikipedia, you can be a reader and an editor. I would argue far too few of us act as editors. Um, and what we do at Sage is, is try to create these sorts of open multi-sided platforms where you can be both a data provider and a data analyzer. And there, luckily there are some things, there's some green shoots in the open movement we can point at that, that start to get at this. One is the Wikipedia nearby. Right? So the fundamental thing about these platforms is they get bigger the more people use them, but we don't always, in the open movement, focus on attracting users. We focus on the number of assets licensed on a regular basis, not the number of people adding. And we make it hard for people to very seamlessly come in and add one image to the commons. And Wikipedia nearby is a great example. It says, hey, you're near the Washington Monument. We could use a great Wikipedia photograph of the Washington Monument. Would you like to take one? The new Knight, founded, uh, Knight Foundation funded project at Creative Commons called The List is another great example of this. Right? Small, easy ways that you can become a contributor to the cultural commons, increase the number of users of the commons. And it changes people from only being on the buy side as a Wikipedia viewer to being a Wikipedia contributor or a Creative Commons contributor. There's nothing wrong with celebrating the number of assets licensed. I do it all the time. Right? But when you think about the strategies that we use to build the commons or the open educational movement or the open access movement or the open science movement, we have to attract users who get value from being on both sides of the deal. Right? Because whether it's open or closed, these multi-sided platforms, they get more valuable than more people participate in it. And so a huge part of this has to be about engaging people to think of themselves as part of the market. And we don't think about it that way. And I'm, you know, my point is that I think we should. Because I think it changes our strategies. And I think that those Wikipedia and Creative Commons apps are really good examples of strategies that are lightweight ways to get people into our market. And it's a better market. It's more fair. It's more moral if you're on both sides. And so you know, I've spent years asking whether or not a given asset is open. I can tell you there are people in the world who disagree radically with me on my answers to this question sometimes. Um, but I think it's the wrong question strategically. It's a very important tactical question. Uh, and that's why things like the Budapest Open Access uh, Initiative Declaration are so important, right? They let us draw a bright line around any given asset. But it changes the strategy about how we bring someone in, right? The difference is we say that asset might be a, a Creative Commons by non-commercial no derivatives license. But the fact that you as a user wanted to join us is something to celebrate. 
And that's a very different strategy. And unfortunately, some of the people who, uh, uh, on the open access side, might license an asset that way don't necessarily agree with me uh, that we should welcome them into the movement. Right? There's, there's a sense that we should, you should change the definitions. Right? The definitions are vital to say whether or not an asset is open or not. But the fact that someone has joined the movement is something to celebrate, because that grows the market, that grows the platform. But I really think if we want to get out of the box that we've put ourselves in, we have to connect to people who don't agree with us philosophically. You know, selling the open philosophy is really important. It's something I believe in. It's something I live. But if we're going to scale this, right, we can look at open source software as an example. Right? It didn't scale because of the philosophy of freedom or openness. It scaled because methodologically and economically it was more valuable than closed content. Right? The Apache web server was an economic weapon for IBM to leverage against Microsoft. Right? It wasn't a philosophy thing. Right? But then it didn't matter from a philosophy perspective. This is sort of Yochai Benkler's great insight is it doesn't matter why you're open. It's actually better if you have a diversity of incentives instead of just the philosophy. Right? That's what lets you scale. That's what makes you robust against attack is a diversity of incentives. And so to scale this outside of the open box, right, our argument at Sage has been that we have to make the argument that it's more valuable to be open than it is to be closed. Right? The thing that you make available is more valuable if it's open than if it's closed. And a good way to teach people this rather easily is to say, think about searching Google and then think about searching Google Scholar. And think about the value you get from searching Google as opposed to the value you get from searching Google Scholar. So rather than is it open or not, the question that we try to ask is, does it create more value than a closed version? Because this, the argument that engages a person in using that content is so much easier. Right? The argument in engaging someone as a donor of the content is so much easier. Because you say, by being open, your data is more valuable than if you keep it closed. Right? And showing them by making sure there's a network of users. And so I work a lot with, with people who have rare diseases. And this is the argument. And they don't want to be open because of philosophy. They want to be open because they're afraid they're going to die and no one's ever going to look at their data. And openness is a methodology that gets their data in front of people. And that's a victory that's so much easier to get than trying to talk about the philosophy of remix or the philosophy of openness. And those are all things I care enormously about and will spend hours talking about. Most of my time, I'm not talking to people who agree with me. And this is the big lesson I've learned. And it requires practice change. So this is the difference in selling a philosophy versus selling a value. Is You're trying to say to someone, if you want this value, you've got to change the way you live. You've got to change the way you work, or you won't get it. Right? Open is actually less relevant than the practice change. So this is just a, a picture of our website and, and my boss, Stephen Friend. Right? So Stephen sort of had a road to Damascus moment uh, when he was the vice president of, of global cancer research at Merck six years ago, saying, you know, if we're going to actually figure out why genetic variations affect individual health outcome, right, we need so many genomes available and open that it's never going to happen inside a pharmaceutical company. He actually tried to pitch it at Merck. Uh, if you go to our website, we archived the presentation he delivered at Merck arguing for a genetic commons six years ago at Merck. It's an internal presentation. We got the permission to, to open up. And they basically said, well, how much is it going to cost? And he said, $500 million. This being Merck, that didn't bother them. They said, how many years of competitive advantage do we get? And he said, well, three, probably, because if it works, anyone can copy the method. And they said, that's fine. You can go start a nonprofit. And they gave, us, you know, they gave us all the assets, and we, we, and we got a bunch of staff out. But the core idea at Sage is, the, is the, this concept that the data is increasing in volume, decreasing in price, increasing in velocity. But if you want to go from that to wisdom, right? wisdom would be, you should take this drug, and you'll feel better, and you won't die. Right? That would be wisdom. That's something we can do with knowledge. That we're not going to get there if we just apply Google's analytics to it. If you run Google's analytics on a clinical data system, it comes back with things like diabetes is connected to glucose. Like, well, we know that, right? That is a relatively stable piece of knowledge. So you need theory and you need experience to analyze the data. And some of that theory is the biology theory, but some of that experience is the advertising analytics experience. So the question was, can we build an open, multi-sided network that connects people who are good at experience with doing data analytics people who are good at theory and people who have their own data or are willing to generate their own data. 
but it takes a total practice change to start collaborating this way. So you know, the first practice change that we had to convince people to make was that your lab is not the natural unit of science. And that sounds like an, you know, a, a very obvious statement, but the reality is we fund as if labs are the natural unit of science. We measure as if labs are the natural unit of science. That's where the paper comes from. A really collaborative paper will have two or three labs on it, especially in the life sciences. You know, only in the context of something like the Human Genome Project do you get a truly multi-lab paper. But over the last five years, there's been a change in federal funding practice towards collaborations and consortia. Right, the, there's even been you know, uh, the, the statement of consortium fatigue setting in in the NIH because this has been so trendy. And so we thought to ourselves, well, this is an opportunity. Right, these consortia are required by the terms of their funding to work with each other, right? not to be open, but to work with each other, to be open among themselves. And they, we figured they probably don't do it very well right? because they don't know how to. They haven't been trained. So we identified a couple, uh, and this is for the the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas, that's what TCJ stands for. This is a $100 million uh, project of the National Cancer Institute and the National Institutes of Health here. The idea is to create an atlas of the genomes of the most common kinds of cancer tumors. So uh, you're looking at you know, almost 250 scientists from 28 institutions who are required by the terms of their funding to work together. And we said, how do they share their data? And when we looked at it, okay, well, they've got a data portal. That's a good thing. But what does it actually look like? It's an FTP archive. And if you don't like that, they also have an HTTP version. And, and if I wanted access to this and I wasn't part of the TCGA, I would petition. And they were pretty good about giving access, right? They're, they're not out there trying to keep people out of it. It just didn't occur to them that there was a totally different practice that they could take on. And they were having all sorts of problems because the things like, how do you know when data's been added to the FTP archive? How do you know that if I'm working on it, uh, that it's a different version than the one that David's been working on? And so you had massive statistical and semantic clashes in the analysis that blocked the consortium from analyzing their data collaboratively. And the problem isn't that they're open or closed, it's that people aren't writing things down. Right? There's all sorts of tacit stuff that happens in data analysis that the pedagogy doesn't teach you is important to write down. The pedagogy says, as long as you get that paper out, you're good, right? Now, if you change the biological protocol, you need to write that down. But you know, there's a major science practice problem here that says, you know, if you're going to normalize and deduplicate a data set, you need to write that down. Because otherwise, the people at the other labs don't understand why the data set is different than it was yesterday, or how the data set is different. Right? It's like sports. You want to be able to rewind the tape and analyze what happened, break it down, and make it better. So, you know, we were lucky, you know, Stephen, my boss, knows all these people, uh, our staff know these people, they're our colleagues and our friends. So we were agreed that we would spend six months doing bi-weekly phone calls with more than 200 people, right, getting them used to the practice change, right? The guy Larson who did this is like a saint. Uh, and it's, it's a shame that we can't sort of recognize him as a hero of open science more easily. But, you know, the person who sits and wrangles the cats on these phone calls is the person who makes this possible. And this is the sort of stuff that comes out of it. So this is an example of a data set inside, inside the consortium. As you see, it's been re-annotated, it's been deduplicated. Right? Four different versions of the data set. This is, you probably can't see it very easily, but there's actually four different versions of the data set, a complete file history and annotations. Right? And this is sort of like version control in GitHub. But the difference is that you're not editing the file. You don't want to edit data the way you edit <laughs> software. Right? The data is the data. The genomes don't get edited. That's what came off the machine. What changes is the way that we process and interpret them. So we have to capture a graph, which is what you see over on the right, of all the different things that have operated on it. So at the top you have older, at the bottom you have newer, and you can see that we took two files, merged them, you can see the names of the people who merged them, the dates they merged them, everything gets a DOI. So we build a giant provenance and tracking graph of the methods, because the methods are what give us the probability of some prediction about science. And so what you want to is if, if you have a prediction that says, you know, John's 85% likely to respond positively to Tylenol PM, I want to be able to rewind the videotape and figure out why you think that. And I want to see at every stage who touched it and where, because each of those things affect the probability's accuracy. It trusts the confidence I can have. Because the flip side of probability is confidence. Or you can say it's 86% probable that John will die if he takes Tylenol, and I would say, I don't have a lot of confidence in that. 
and I want to be able to go back and prove why. So the practice change required to do this is enormous. If you're used to just analyzing your data in the Wild West and not tracking any of this, this is miserable. Right? The people, people encounter our software sometimes for the first time, they're like, this sucks. And we're like, well, you know, we can have a debate over to whether the software sucks or not. I mean, we're a nonprofit. It's not exactly our specialty to make it beautiful. But when we dig in, it's almost always what sucks is the practice change, right? not the software. And distinguishing those two things is really important. And when you focus on value, that's much easier than when you're saying, my software is good because it's open. See, the value comes from changing your practice. And what's nice also is you start to get proof points. So when we combine this practice with the provenance and the version control, right, we take this sort of weird amalgamated mass of researchers and data that was really slow getting publications out. Right? We're, we're trying to quantify uh, exactly how big the jump was. But I can tell you that before they started working with us, they had less than five papers submitted. Within nine months of working with us, they had 18 papers accepted. Right? And this was one group in the broader cancer genome atlas. Um, they have you know, 14 or so working groups besides the pan-cancer consortium that we brought in. And every single working group has joined our process without any additional recruiting because of the structure of the way that we framed this. Everyone else now says, I want the productivity boost that came from the open methods which were required because of our collaboration system. They're not in because they believe in openness, but they're now in a framework where every time they publish a paper, they punch a button, and all that provenance and metadata goes live and becomes public. Right, the value brought them in. Right, so another example would be, you know, so now we said it's not just solo labs, but it's communities. But those are communities that were required to work together. So can we bring together a community that wasn't required to work together with the same argument? So the idea was, let's find a place where there are competing papers claiming the same knowledge creation. So this is from colon cancer. This is one year, four major papers and four different major publications um, in four different stacks of, of, of science journal sort of corporations or, or, non, or, or nonprofits, each claiming to come up with the genetic subtype of colon cancer. Not surprisingly, each paper comes up with a different canonical subtype for colon cancer. So this would be, these would be the mutations that distinguish colon cancer, right? So in theory, all four of them should arrive at the same result. But they used, each of them uses different math, each of them had a different population. So each of them had a radically different subtype. And we kept digging, we found uh, multiple more papers on top of these sort of four most famous ones. So we went and we said to them, you know, this is how you built your analysis. And each of you has a different subtype. Some of you have you know, the, the green dominating. Some of you have the blue dominating. These represent sort of different kinds and sets of mutations. Wouldn't it be nice if each of you could run your math on the sum total of everyone's data? This is the value. It's not right, the idea that you should share your stuff for no reason. It's if you share, you can run your math on all six. Aren't you sure you're best? And after we went and we got four, we had nine more groups approach us to join the community because they didn't want to get left out. So each of the groups now gets to run their algorithms on all 13 data sets. And then we get to wrangle together a consensus subtype that gets published that has the highest probability of survival over a longer period of time because it has the largest data set and it has all the eyes from all 13 of the groups looking at it. Because the knowledge from any one of those papers was going to keep getting knocked down by the knowledge from each of the other papers. Because the way that we publish doesn't say, is it true or not? It just says, is it true enough? So we're like, OK, this is cool. We could go from solo labs to communities, whether they're required to or not. And we're going to be announcing like 10 more of these communities in the new year. Uh, I can tell you that this is starting to explode in a way that looks like a network effect. You know, the hard part is making sure that everyone who joins learns how to do the practice change at a deep enough level to take advantage of it. I'm not sure we know how to scale that yet, and that's a pedagogy problem that we might want to talk about. Right? But we don't just want to appeal to the scientific elite, right? The groups I've been showing you are on the theory side of the data knowledge continuum, not the experience side. So can we run challenges or competitions that get people who are outside of the system participating? So there was already a group called the Dream Project, which was a, a joint project of IBM and Columbia that built a really good community of biological data analysts. 
They'd spent eight years running challenges in sort of reverse engineering analytic methods in, in the life sciences. Um, and we said, you know, let's work with them. Let's get a training set. We worked on breast cancer, so we got some data that was already out there from Oslo and from Oxford. We got the Avon Foundation to generate the exact same data types on 500 women who, who had never been profiled openly. And we said, can you predict the odds that five years after successful treatment with chemotherapy that a woman would relapse with breast cancer? Right? Can we predict that probability? Google uh, gave us free compute space so no one had to sort of work on storage or pay for processing because that's a real barrier to entry, especially in the developing world. Um, and then we got Science Translational Medicine, right, not an open publisher, uh, to agree to publish the winner with the contest counting as peer review. So there's no cash, but the winner gets a guaranteed publication in a top level uh, journal as a prize. And we said, if you want to be on the leaderboard, you've got to share your code. Because we didn't want this to be a contest based on the skill level of the programmers. So what was interesting is uh, we required code sharing to the beginning and no one shared their code. Uh, and then we said, no, we're serious, uh, and no one shared their code. And then we said, okay, first one who gets to the top of the leaderboard using someone else's code gets 500 bucks. And the first one whose code is used by someone to get to the top of the leaderboard, they also get 500 bucks. And also, by the way, we're not going to let you win if you don't share your code. And within nine days of putting this in, the average accuracy of the models was 1,000% improved. Right? I mean, it's incredible the value you get. And the other benefit of this is, so you know, the winning model, you know, we got the cover of Science Translational Medicine. We didn't just get an article. We got a cover, an editorial, a methods article, as well as the actual science article. Um, and this is much more accurate than the previous models were. But what's interesting from a pedagogy perspective is, because of the code sharing requirement, we didn't just make them all better. There's an entire suite of algorithmic approaches. Because some of those models are going to get better as more data comes online. Some of those models are going to get worse as more data comes online. And the entire suite of tools is now available to everyone to take on to attack the way that we combine genetic information and health data to predict the odds of cancer relapse. And of course, the winner was not a biologist. The winner was the lab that invented the MP3 codec at Columbia. And no one wanted to hear their theory. They had this theory that there were metagenes that went across all cancers, right? It was a very philosophical argument, very semantic, ontological argument, and no one believed them. Right? None of the scientists wanted to hear it. So this is an example of, of you know, practice change. Right? We both have to get the people who are the experts, who are the academy, to work together, and we have to design new practices that bring in people who aren't part of the academy. And that's tough, right? That's tough to scale. And it, you know, we spent probably four and a half years getting no traction, right? When you're below the, the, the line and the network effect, it's awful, right? You're convinced that you're doing the wrong thing. You have to be somewhat insane to keep going, right? But the evidence starts to, to mount. And so we've had 25% user growth, data analyst growth for eight straight quarters. If we were a company, we'd be raising a gigantic round of venture capital right now. But the idea is that having an open platform is really important because if we do this well enough, companies will come in and do it too. But when you have an open player in the market, it changes the entire market. Browsers are different because Firefox exists. Encyclopedias are different because Wikipedia exists. The markets are more moral, right? and they're just less assholey. Pardon my French. <laughs> So these, these practice changes are really important when you're talking about you know, the scientists themselves. Uh, but it's not just the practitioners who have to change. I would argue that we, those of us who advocate for open, have to change our own practice as well. Right? We've focused a lot on the question of how do we govern open? Right? Definitions, manifestos, declarations. I've written a few. Right? But when you talk about platforms, right, the, the business school texts say there are Three other things you have to think about for platforms. Right? How many sides? Right? And in particular, are you either a buyer or a seller, or are you both at all times? Right? The price. And price is non-trivial even in things that are free. You know, everything I'm talking about here, we provide those as free services, the codes in GitHub, but we run them as free beer services on Amazon. Because knowing how to configure an open cloud service is very different than giving someone an installable that runs on their computer. And so you can stand up everything I've shown you. You can stand up our Synapse platform, our Bridge platform. Everything we do is open sourced. It's in GitHub. But the skill in knowing how to actually run those is not very widely distributed. So we do have to think about price. 
you know, in an open platform, you want the price to always be commodity based or cost recovery based. But I, I think the big question is platform design. Because we haven't really made an attempt to design the way that software gets designed. There are entire classes of people who do nothing but focus on how much white space is on your phone, or what your font is, right? How to use design to engage you and draw you in so you spend hours on the platform that you're on, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or whatever. And we don't really focus on design as a community. And I think we do. If we're, if we're going to be a platform, we have to think about design. And the reason that I believe that is, you, know, you look at something like the iPhone, the Apple designers didn't sit down and say, let's design a closed ecosystem. Right? Their preliminary bias was to be closed, because that's most people's preliminary bias. But their, their, their idea was, let's build the best damn phone we can for the user. Let's build a phone that gives the user the most value. And they had money. They had all these other things, but that focus on value to the user, I think, is actually the differentiator. And the good news is that open platforms are so much more ethical and engaging because you're not just a buyer or a seller. You're, you're a participant, right? You're a citizen. You're a member. Though, actually, if we start to embrace this idea, not let's build an open, open ecosystem just for the sake of it, but let's make it better for the user. Right? We have an innate design advantage because we're not trying to make people fail to read the terms. We want people to read the terms. Right? We're not trying to lock people into the easiest thing. We're trying to lock them into something that lifts them up. You know, and that's what design does. Right? Design says the user is the most important thing, not the asset. Right? And the asset's important. The licenses are vital. Right? I believe fundamentally that I'm, you know, I'm considered um, irrational by a lot of people in my insistence on CC BY and CC ZERO. Right? But the reason I believe in those things is because I think those prioritize the user. They prioritize whether I'm giving content or receiving content, BY and ZERO give me more value. They create more potential value. And if we design right, we can embed open into systems that have never even thought about it. Because we've only really touched the surface of what can be open. Right? We've only really touched the surface of what we can crack open. Copyright is in many ways easier because at least there's a horrible international standardized regime. Right? That makes it possible to have a standardized set of non-horrible tools. Yeah, but I've been, spent, I've been spending the last couple of years working on informed consent, which is not a system that's ever been open. So this is, uh, as far as I can tell, this is the, the, the earliest surviving informed consent document. It's from a series of yellow fever experiments in Cuba a little over 100 years ago. And we literally asked people to risk their lives to get bitten by mosquitoes to see if mosquitoes transmitted the disease instead of what were called fomites. It was a, a thing that everybody knew, right? Everybody knew that diseases like yellow fever were caused by bad air coming off of people's clothing. And everybody knew it wasn't mosquitoes. And that was a stable knowledge continuum for about 100 years until someone said, you know what, let's put people into a room with mosquitoes, put people into a room with dirty clothes, so you get sick. <laughs> right? And so they consented people for this, which was miraculous at the time. Right? They actually asked you to sign a document that warned them that they could die. That was the risk. The benefit was to science, and also they would get paid. And the concept of informed consent is that you should, as an individual, get to judge the benefit-risk ratio and make an unbiased um, decision as to whether or not you want to join. What we are now is, uh, these forms are written by doctors, they're reviewed by lawyers, and then on top of that, they're edited by committees. And you get 18-page documents full of liability text that are handed to patients when they're enrolling into a study, and they say, if you don't sign this as it is, you can't get in. And it's a complete lack of agency, and for the most part, you're panicked. Right? You've got a disease, you have a chance to take a drug that might save your life, you sign the form. You have a rare disease, you want to get into a long-term study, you sign the form. And these forms default into the concept of no public access. Right? In order to protect your privacy, which is often to protect the liability of the institution or the competitive advantages of the person gathering the data, the data are never shared. And so this is kind of tragic. Uh, we already have an incredibly bad participation in clinical studies in this country. It's you know, less than 5% of people with cancer ever get into a study. And that's just an easy one. Um, so we have, a, we have a membership problem, we have a scale problem. You know, the, the largest longitudinal study of Parkinson's disease in the world is under 2,000 people. And for comparisons, the Facebook 
emotional contagion study had 689,000 people. When Google A-B tests, they test on Utah or Nevada. But our clinical studies consider it okay to claim knowledge with less than 2,000 people and making sure that those data sets can never be recombined. And so the value to the participant in the clinical study is actually really low, right? The paper isn't open access. The data doesn't get reused or recombined. They don't ever talk to the clinician, right? And they don't have any agency or participation. So, you know, I wanted to break this open. I said, this is a great place to do open, right? It makes sense. But, you know, I was lucky. I was working at a nonprofit that was run by a guy who was an interaction designer when I was getting this idea. And so I spent a year and a half doing what's called persona creation and interaction work. And so this is the sort of thing you do when you're designing a product for a company. You know, David Four, who was my boss, was, the, was a former top guy at Cooper Design, where he worked for a lot of large multinational companies. And so what you do is you say, who's going to use it? And you give them names, you create photographs, you give them backstories. And you imagine what it's like for them. Right? It's an empathy-based process more than anything. Because you create the names, you're not thinking abstractly, you know, uh, we need to create an open consent form. You say, right, for Tim Boylan, who's here on the left, right, he's dead, right, um, and he has this conversion at the end of his life where he wants his data to be used after he dies, right? Or we have a doctor on the right, and you say, you know, her goal is to be an authoritative figure in front of her patients uh, and to increase efficiency, right, because they have different goals. But these are the people who would have signed a consent form together to share that data. And so the concept is, what's a product design that's open, that creates sharing, that changes the way these two people interact. And that's not a contract. That's not a new legal document. Right? That would not be considered sufficient anywhere except in the legal world. So what we came up with was a visual design language. So we said, what are the icons that would represent what a clinical study would look like? So if you have cancer, one of the big questions we say is, are you depressed and how are you sleeping? So can we come up with a visual iconographic scale for those things? Um, because these are key elements of informed consent. They would be in that 18-page document. Every document tells you the study tasks. Every document tells you the risks and the benefit. Everyone tells you what kind of data you're going to collect. Everyone tells you how it's going to be shared, which is usually we won't. And we said, you know what, we're going to actually create a couple of studies. So we're running a study in Parkinson's disease that starts in the, in the first quarter, and we're running a study in post-chemotherapy cognitive impact that also starts in the first quarter. And so rather than create things that are open as a standard without any users, we said, we're going to only build the things that we need to use in the studies, and we're going to back out all the assets into an open source toolkit. So everything we do starts with a user. And then the beauty is, right, part of being open source is not just making things, it's curating things that are already open. So we went to the Noun project, we went to Open Clip Art, right, Creative Commons, buy and public domain tools that are available. And we said, there are literally thousands of icons that are, are representative of the kinds of actions that take place in clinical study, but no one's ever collected them in one place. So that's another part of what we've done is said, you know, we're going to go out to the commons and pull in as many of these things as we can. Right, the nouns and the verbs are good, but when you spend time working with designers, you say you also need sentences. So there are some concepts that are more complex than you can have with just an icon. An icon is good for DNA or a medical record, but this concept that we're going to separate your identity from your data is an animation. The concept that we're going to distribute your data for reuse is an animation. So we're providing those as well. Again, all of this is CC by licensed or public domain. Storyboard layouts. Not everyone who wants to stand up one of these longitudinal studies knows how to lay out for a mobile device. And so you know, everything we've done with every designer is going to be made available. It's not just the end product. It's all the methods. And this, is a, this is a practice change as an open sort of you know, open free culture person is to say literally every method has to be open. It can't just be the end product because if we hand it to you, how do you know how to make your own? Right? We put these together into stories that create informed consent. So this is, if you think of the human readable layer of a Creative Commons license, this is the human readable layer of our informed consent agreement. It says we're going to ask you to, to tap on the phone. And so this is actually for our Parkinson's study. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain this real quick. So the insight was uh, when you go to the doctor for Parkinson's to get into that 2,000 person cohort, the doctor has a set of scales that they rate you on. How is your walking on a scale of one to five? How strong are you from a tremor perspective on a scale of one to five? Right? How stable is your voice? These are very 
subjective opinion-based things the doctor comes up with, and they happen four times a year. Uh, and of course, you do your best when you're in front of the doctor. And what we realized was all of these things could be done on, to, on a phone in a data-driven way. So we're going to ask you to take a survey that says, how are you walking today on a scale of one to five? But as soon as you rate it, we're going to send you a notification that says, OK, holding your phone in your right hand, take 10 steps forward and 10 steps back. And during that phase, we record all of the sensors on your phone to see your gyroscopes, your GPS, your accelerometer. And we can get a data-driven measure of how you walk. Same when you say, how's your hand tremor? As soon as you answer that, hold the phone stable for 10 seconds. And we record the tremor of your hand. We ask you to say, ah, into the microphone for 10 seconds. And we get your voice tremor. And we get this beautiful, long-term long right, analysis of the data. And the cost changes radically. So we've gotten approval from the ethical board to enroll 100,000 people in the study. So even if we only get half, it's a 25x increase in the data. And not only that, every participant gets their data back, and the data that's available is openly reusable. And so all this architecture I'm showing you creates that same sets of freedom. The data goes back to the participant, and the data goes into the commons as you generate it. And now if you want to take it out, if you want to take out the patient empowerment and the sharing, you can, but we all know the importance of default settings. So we're also providing reference implementations, all of our clinical documents. We spent hours, weeks, writing protocols, doing the paperwork, laying out the forms that you need to apply to an IRB, which is the group that decides whether or not what you're doing is ethical. All the way down to the web templates and assets. So literally everything it takes to stand up a clinical study on a phone is going to be made available as an open source tool with a bias towards patient data return and the comments. And again, you can take it out, but you're going to have to do the work to do that. If you want to use it the easiest possible way, the way that it's designed cohesively, right, you're going to wind up being open whether you want to or not because the methods are, are better for you. And then the other piece is that there's another reason to make this available as, an open, as a fully open tool, right? to not put in no derivatives or non-commercial license. And that's because we may be running these two studies on, on phones and tablets, but there's a lot of other contexts where someone does informed consent. In the US, you get informed consent when you go in for treatment or for payment. And there's no reason that you couldn't create a printed human readable overlay to those things to increase engaged uh, informedness. There's no reason you couldn't build this for a doctor to use in the room with a patient. Right? But we can't do that. We can create more value for everyone if we let everyone else do that. I can also tell you as a product creator, I've spent a lot of years as a preacher and an advocate. Now that I'm actually making a product, it's really enabling to go, that's a fantastic idea, you should do that. It's so much better than having to do it yourself. It's just, it's wonderful. And so, you know, this is an example of how an open method creates more value, right? The data is reusable, the data goes back to the participant, right? If you're a clinician, right, you go from, oh my God, how am I gonna explain this freaking terrible document to people to thinking about how do I build a process that makes people my partners? You know, I've been stunned at the lack of negative response to this. And it's because the field is so weak that almost any design-based approach would have made it better. By making the first design-based approach be an open design-based approach, we can sneak open in in a way that scales. Right? And we create more value. And it's not just economic value. I mean, I would argue that putting the patients in the center of their own study has an economic value, but it also has a social value, a moral value, it has a scientific value. And hopefully it has an educational value. Because the people who participate in this Parkinson's study are going to learn a lot about their Parkinson's by being in the study. And it's not going to be a passive thing where they get scared because they're going to Dr. Google. You know, they're part of the educational process. They're part of the knowledge creation process in a way that they couldn't be if we did it any other way. And so, you know, this is a, I'm almost done. This is a graph of what a Bayesian tree looks like. And, and what we do when we do probability-based learning is we add more data to refine the model. And so what we're going to do in Parkinson's is refine the model that says, why is it that some people get sick faster than other people? But what we know about that is a lot less stable than it used to be, and it's going to keep getting less and less stable as we go. And if we're locked into a way that we teach scientists that just takes books and puts them onto computers, 
right? The pedagogy is not going to keep up with that because the book, right, is basically a container for knowledge that we think is stable. And if, if this is what we have to teach with, right, there's no way that the pedagogy for science is going to keep up with the methods that I just showed you. Because whether those methods are open or closed, those are the methods. Right? We have a choice about the platforms and, the, and sort of the morals and the ecosystems, but the methods are the methods. Until someone invents better ways of analyzing large-scale data, right, the methods are going to be probability, inference, and prediction. And if you can't rapidly feed the changes into your educational system, we are all basically screwed. Right? And so the right to reuse, right? You know, we talk about the right to reuse in the, you know, the OER definitions, uh, in the open access definitions, the open knowledge definitions. Right? But if you don't have the right to reuse, right, you, you don't have the right to be current. You don't have the right to keep up with the probability-based models as they change. Right? You don't have the right to get better. Right? You are stuck with knowledge that practitioners in the field consider outdated. And a great example of this is in radiology. Right? A very underpowered study said that really high doses of radiation on lung tumors uh, was better than really low doses. Right? This was right at the absolute tolerance limit of what human bodies can take in terms of radiation. Right? The study was done on less than 50 people. It was published in a very high impact journal. It's become the standard of care in a lot of places. Although it has never been replicated and it's been demonstrated to kill people faster than the old way. Because the knowledge was propagated through the traditional channels and it can't be updated effectively, right? it's literally blocking human beings from being healthier. So the right to reuse, right, it's a really important right because it lets you get better. And, and really in the end, it's, it's the right to create new value. Because it's really important to create new value. It's not just about putting something out and being satisfied that it's done. It's saying that the ability to create new things that are better, right, that are more current, that's what value is. And we can't let the conversation about value be dominated by economics. Economics is important, jobs are important, but the moral impact of being a participant in the systems that surround you right, cannot be left behind. Right? It's really important. And when you engage people in a system where they have the ability to create value and receive value that's not just economic value, that's knowledge value, that's social value, that's moral value, they want to be a part of it. And I think that's what we need to argue for in open science. That's what we argue for in open access. And I hope that you in open education work with us because I'm terrified that we're going to wind up with lock-in on systems that make it impossible to take advantage of these tools. Thank you. It doesn't count when she stands up because we're married. <laughs> uh, so we have time. Uh, two questions, three, two or three questions. Anyone? Come on, I, I saw you nodding. Some of you have questions. All right, Cable. I'll ask, I'll ask three questions. <laughs> so, so, John, you talked about uh, what do we need to do in terms of uh, open pedagogy, rethinking, learning. Uh, how do we, in a, in a world of academic freedom where every professor has the right to do exactly what she or he wants and we never can or should infringe on that. How do you encourage uh, cooperation sharing, not only of content, but of, uh, of practices, new ways of teaching? How do we share in real time uh, both the data, what our students are doing, the content we're sharing? How do you switch that culture that we have in higher education that are educating the people that are becoming the scientists? I mean, I, I don't have a great answer. Um, I, there's got to be a pedagogy of collaboration. Right? There, there's got to be a method for collaborating that is abstract enough to be taught. I'm just not sure it's been created. And, but this is the sort of thing where my bias is, if we could figure out a pedagogy, of a curriculum for collaborating, that open educational resources are the best way to distribute that you know, across the globe as quickly as possible. You know, the, we teach scientists now, and I have my biases towards science, obviously that's where I have my experience. Um, we teach scientists data analysis, right? Scientists have to go through a six hour ethics course if they're gonna work on human subjects uh, data. Um, we have all of these things that are a part of the core first year graduate curriculum for being a scientist. 
you know, it's ridiculous that they don't have a week where they learn how to collaborate effectively using the internet. And it strikes me that that's, that's the easiest thing to do, and that's the first thing that I would want to do. I mean, it would be so much easier for us at Sage if people knew that they needed to collaborate over the internet, then we wouldn't have to teach them why to use our platform, right? Or even some of the basic practices like, you know, take notes. I mean, it's incredible how we don't teach people to be collaborative. And so that's sort of the first thing. And then in terms of, in terms of the professors, um, realistically, we can, we can hack the incentive system a little bit, uh, which is that the people who are collaborating this way are generating far more papers than the people who aren't collaborating this way. Uh, that's been the best way we've gotten people in, is not by convincing them, but by having them be totally afraid that they're going to miss out. And so you know, those are sort of my two things, are you know, cultivate fear of missing out uh, whenever possible. And, you know, but I would love, you know, if anyone wants to work with us at Sage on, you know, doing a sort of a regression analysis or a back bearings on um, how people are collaborating using our system so that we could quantify how they do it and how useful it is, like, I would love to convert that into a curriculum that we could make available as an OER resource. Um, because I know a lot of, of PhD institutions that are desperate to teach their scientists not to be left behind. But I don't know anyone who's devoting the resources to figuring out how to teach them that. So just to repeat the question, so, so is uh, that she's, when she talks to social scientists that they're satisfied that because they're dealing with human subjects data, they don't have to share. Uh, and that is very true. That's, a very, that's the standard of practice right now in anything that touches humans, uh, anywhere except large companies, right? Because of course, if you're a company, you're not restricted. Uh, uh, if, you're, if you want to publish the results of your human subjects research, you need consent. If you don't want to publish, you don't. We have really weird law right now. Um, so part of the rationale for, for a toolkit for informed consent was that um, in, consent is not restricted to the biological sciences or to the health and medical sciences. Um, and so m my experience with the IRBs is, uh, or the, the, these are the ethical boards that review research protocols, is that they are not necessarily anti-sharing. Uh, um, it's more that they've never seen how you could share the data in a way that was both driving science and had some privacy protections left in it. And this is a place where, for example, like strict adherence to open definitions doesn't help. Right? So the, the vast majority of the data we're collecting at SAGE doesn't have any IP constraints on it. It has no copyright or data protection constraints. But we do attach data use agreements, which are essentially Hippocratic oaths. Right? I agree, although I might have the power to re-identify, I agree not to use it. I agree not to harm people. I agree not to share the data with people who haven't also signed the contract. Uh, and then the data lives in sort of a, a mildly secure repository where you can get at it and you have inside there you have a lot of freedom. Um, and that's, I think, the first step towards getting where we really need to get, which is to have the data be you know, liquid if people have consented to it. Um, the, the, the practice change, I think, in social sciences is going to come from the researchers who get more value out of sharing their data, right? So we were lucky in the life sciences that the, the federal mandates are requiring collaboration. So we were able to get at those people who had to collaborate and help them collaborate effectively, and then the scientists started fearing that they weren't getting the same benefits, so they joined in. Similarly, with, with the consent work, we found people who already wanted this. We found patient groups who desperately wanted to have large-scale data that could be endlessly analyzed, and we're working with them to go forward. And we found a few sort of clinicians who were really enlightened and wanted to go there. And so what I would advise if, is if you can find a few people in a given social science discipline that want this, making it unbelievably easy for them to do it and demonstrate the quantitative benefit they got as a researcher is how you'll create that sort of competitive desire to catch up. And the, you know, a, motivated, a motivated faculty member with a really good plan can get things through IRBs. But if that faculty member isn't motivated and has to write their entire plan themselves, they're just going to keep doing it the way they always have.
Okay, we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you.